Hey, g'day, I'm Toby, and this is my channel, Ask Toby. Um, it's a channel where hopefully people will ask me um, things they want to see done and tools they want to see restored and maybe bits about uh, stabilizing timbers and that sort of thing. Uh, I've been in the building industry 15, nearly 20 years, uh, so quite a lot of experience. I'm not a fabricator by any means, but do have a lot of experience with building, repairing things. Um, was never good at school, but definitely know my way around a, a workshop and tools. So um, I started this video a year ago, actually last Christmas. I got the I got the uh, Gamaco kit from my wife um, to build a forge last Christmas. Now obviously it was a uh, I, I bought it and paid for it and everything, but it's technically from my wife now. Uh, this is a video I think I could have done with maybe beforehand. I watched a lot of videos and I found some of them were pretty useful. Um, had some good stuff in it. Some of them really didn't make sense why people would have chosen to do things the way they did. Um, and like I say, with the experience I have in the building industry, I thought, you know what, I'm going to put a video together that I think actually puts together minute by minute, essentially, how to build a forge. So I think this is for someone who has done very little fabrication, maybe just bought himself a welder, decided they want to get this forge together and actually doesn't even really know where to start, maybe um, very little sort of experience on the tools. So. Uh, it is a long video. It's an hour and 20 minutes, I believe. Um, please feel free to fast forward through uh, any sections that you've already got sort of down pat. And I've um, gone into detail, real heavy detail on some things that I found more difficult to find out information on, like the angle of the burner and so on and so forth. Um, now, this is all my opinion. This is all stuff that I've just sort of worked out from my own research and figured out and learnt before having ever forged anything. So I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, I have now been forging for over a year and I do it quite frequently um, and I'm getting reasonable at it. And there is things on this video that potentially uh, I might have done slightly differently, but having finally finished this editing uh, a year later, um, over sort of eight or 10 hours of, of filming down to an hour and something, um, I'm watching it back thinking, no, this is still a really good video that I I could have watched beforehand and I probably could have built a video off of it. So I really believe this is going to make some difference to people during this project. So uh, thank you so much for your time and energy watching it. Uh, this is a very long intro as well, but I really appreciate your uh, subscriptions. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to see done, please just ask me and please share this video and like this video and click on your bell button so you see any new subscriptions that come through. Um, I'd love to hear your comments and if there's anything you think that I could have done differently, I'd love to hear that as well. Thank you very much and have an awesome day. What I will add to that is actually that, like I say, this is a Gamaco kit. Um, I would say a lot of people spend time and energy making burners and that sort of stuff. I think for the sake of about 300 bucks, you can't go better than, than the Gamaco kit. It's really so easy to put together. The kit's so well designed and engineered. I've got uh, I've got history in the in the gas industry, um, so it makes some sense to me that if someone's already produced it, then use it. So if you're in Australia, I wouldn't bother sort of messing around making your own. Just buy a Gamaco kit burner and put it together. Thanks very much, Gamaco. And in no way am I sponsored by them. Okay, so I spent quite a bit of time trying to work out how to mark this, seeing a lot of people do some odd, peculiar setups with bits of wood and all that, trying to mark them. We know around about how high we want to cut it. So let's just grab a square, a sharpie, simple clamp. And if you just put your sharpie, try to work out where you, how high you want it, which I'll put a little dot there, and then Put a clamp on, should be as easy as spinning on the flat surface. Now I've done all this before I cut any of the, the ends off, because they're the thing that keep this thing level and square. This is all built in a factory, you know this is going to be exactly perfect. So why try to recreate the wheel when you've already got an exactly square setup? So now, with no wavy jiggly lines all over the place, you've got yourself a perfect straight line all the way around. Again, we want a nice straight cut for, well, at least a good square place to start from. 
So why not use this because it's square already. Nice neat straight line from there. We haven't cut this off, even though we've got a good marking point. Now again, I've seen all sorts of weird ass ways of trying to get the gas valve out. People just seem to fight with it and do all sorts of crazy ass stuff. Seems to be a much more simple way, but we'll see in a second whether it's gonna work. Stick it in the vise on the bench. Now, I'm not the biggest guy in the world, but there's a lot of leverage in this model. I wonder if I can just give it a good old bear hug. Job done. Top out. Wasn't that hard after all. Wheel instead of a cutting wheel. It's much easier to just take these tops off so we can start marking it out. So the other thing I noticed online was there isn't a great deal of information about sizes of the hole and that sort of thing. So I was thinking about the sort of things I'd want to put in there. Knives, maybe a small axe, something like that. Hammer heads. Now, I suppose it all depends on which way you're putting your stock in and that sort of stuff. But I mean, a hammer head is that one's pretty average, small sort of club hammer head. This is 140 mil or five and a quarter inch. So 40, 45 mil, sort of one and three quarter inch, something like that. Generally anything's going to be going in sort of that way So it doesn't actually have to be that big I'm thinking you want to be able to get tongs in there and move it um, So I'm thinking maybe a hundred and forty mil wide the hole even maybe a, yeah, hundred and forty mil wide by Hundred mil high something like that. So For the time being I'll go ahead and mark it and see if I'm happy with that. So There's my hundred mil. We know this line at the bottom is square to the bottle currently or at least it's square to any something we can start with and we want to get a, a central line so we know that this was the center so we could do that probably just by eye it's not that imperative middle of the gas outlet and then we can measure it either side of that so we said about so we're going to want 70 mil either side of that line now just so we can get a nice square hole it is, it is rounded, so it's going to be a little bit harder, but we can use a square. Pretty good to me. All right, doesn't look like a bad size hole for a forge. So next thing I'm going to do is save myself a bit of faffing around like I see a lot of other people do 
before I start cutting all this open and cutting it off, I'm actually going to weld something to support it. So weld some little feet out of the way of obviously all my cuts. And they may not even be my permanent feet, but they're going to give me a perfect level structure to work with. So I'm literally just going to weld, even if it's just tack weld, a, a, a sort of foot across there and a foot across there. And like I say, they may get moved later because it's just, they're just tack welds, it's just supporting it. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit, grind this paint off, get it all level, sit it on some feet and just tack weld it and then we can work out. Cutting all these because we can double check our levels then, we'll just level across it and measure up from the bench top back and forth. Whatever these pieces are, I'll probably reuse them as the actual legs. So I'm going to cut two pieces at 500 long, which is just basically 19 and a half inches, so anywhere around there. I figure it gives me a good length. I can cut them off afterwards. I can weld downward feet on them if I want, anything like that. Um, like I said, they might get cut off and repositioned, but I'm going to start with 250 mil, uh, 500 mil pieces. Okay, so edges are cleaned up. Two pieces at 500 long. We're going to mark the center of these and then I'm just going to scribe them a little bit because look, I could tack weld it to that. Chances are a couple of good, strong, ugly welds, it's never going to go anywhere, but why not create a bit more surface area? Easiest way to scribe something like this is to get the bottle on, to get these on a, on a flat surface. Like so. This is what they're going to be resting on eventually. And it actually doesn't matter where the bottle is, you're just looking for the correct arc. So we're going to scribe this under here. You can see I've actually done it, but the best way is to use a bit of a spacer, put it under there like that because it follows it, or to have a spacer on the pen. And just basically draw a horizontal line, keeping your pen really horizontal along and you'll end up with a nice shape that fits the underside of the cylinder perfectly when we cut it out. Okay, so I've already cut the other side, done that. What I actually ended up doing was moulding this bit of wire so it's the same shape. And it's relatively flexible, but you can actually get it right. So you just keep checking against the original and just mimic that on all four sides. And then that way I've been able to just literally cut line either side, cut down the middle so I'm double or mark the middle so we've got a center line, and then mimic the shape. So good. have a pretty good finished edge. I'll get the wheel on it to clean it all up, but this is the first I haven't test fitted this yet, but let's see how this goes. Well, look, it's not awesome, but it's pretty good. Clean up with a wheel quite well, and then weld it on. Clean these up, just using a flat wheel again. Making sure they're the same. Pretty much identical, and then all we're doing is just checking. Going, yep, beautiful. Fits, fits. Same with the other one. And then all we're going to do is clean our bench so we're nice and level. Find our place where we want to put them. And just essentially tack them on then we can flip them over and give them a good proper weld on. I'm going to make the outside edges at 160 mil apart give us a bit of a wide stance which is going to be helpful obviously and then so basically we can just transpose that onto these so that we know we're in about the right place we start we'll get this right to the edge because then we know we're square square with something at least 
and bring it into one end's 160. Hold that one down. as well. They we aren't quite square, so what I'll do now is we know we're going to have these welds. Sitting on them. Now I can just measure from here to here and just check that's right and the same on the other side. Get a first tack on. Okay, now we're at this point. We want to check that we're our lines and everything are level before we weld it on, otherwise we're just going to have to redraw them. So we want it pretty good. It doesn't have to be the world's most perfectly level line, but it would be nice if it was a level point. So we're just going to adjust it until we're happy with the, with the line. Okay, it's pretty good. I like that. I've increased these sizes to 170 mil apart, 175 mil apart, outside to outside, just to give me a little bit wider stance. That's all solid. Now there's no reason why I can't just get the welder and just put a tack on here and a tack on here, and then flip it over and weld it properly. Tack one's probably a little bit harder because I've got to get around to it, but we're only tacking it for the moment. Tacks. We should now be able to gently flip her over and uh, weld the feet on properly. There we go. <sighs> Beautiful. A couple of ugly little tacks. So we're just going to get something under either side to stop her rolling away while we're working on it. Now we can get a good seam weld across here and one across the back and be a much more neater. And where are we? There we go. Now we can get a nice little seam weld here and here. And we're we'll laughing. Some of the ugliest welding I've ever seen. But luckily enough, it's all going to be underneath. Like I said, I'm no welder, but I can stick two bits of metal together. So um, I'm going to just clean this up with the grinder. Just had a little thought, trying to do that, just realised one thing I would do differently if I thought about it again now is grind this whole section away first, clean the whole section back to metal, because now I'm going to have issues sort of getting under here trying to clean it, which I'll be able to do, but it'll just be slightly more frustrating than it could have been. So um, I would just do that whole section when you guys do it. I must be doing something right, nice and solid, no rock at all. Here's what we can do now though, we can make sure our rear line is all correct the front one because we're totally completely level now so on here solid so what we can do is we can double check our height and even get a pencil and mark just to make it easier and up. perfect yep happy with that go around the back and be able to do the same when we once we cut this off so we, we know that we're there, so we can see that we're about there somewhere, but we can double check that once we cut this off. This is a perfect way to double check it. Now I meant to say we can actually confirm our center line by doing this because we know this is solid. So it's 210 mil. So basically you're going to be looking for 105 mil. Down there, mark a line, put a level on it, and you get a straight line, which is confirmed we have a completely solid base. We've got something to work with and cut this bit off.
Same as before. Swap back over to a flat wheel and just grind these bits off. Get rid of them. And then we are ready to start chopping them. And all this has taken like, oh, it's taken 30 minutes, something like that. Far less than it seems to be with all the jiggery pokery messing around with blocks of wood and straps and silly things. So this is the same as the back, because obviously when you put your cement in the bottom, you want it all to be the same level. You can now check what your bottom line is. For me, that is now 130 mil off the floor. So I've checked that straight all the way across. And then I've just mimicked that on the back here. So basically I've just gone along and <laughs> marked it wrong. Actually I want 130. For some reason I've marked 120. And this is why my dad always said, measure thrice, or measure thricey, cutty, oncey. Because I had a hole in the wrong place. Bottom line is not only is it correct with the other side, but it's perfectly level to the base, which is obviously what's important. Alright, so I want this little hole at the back. I don't actually have to do this. I've seen this done without a hole at the back. My reasoning mainly for it is maybe controllability, but more. If I ever want to do anything long, like, I don't know, a sword, something a bit longer, I want to be able to put it all the way through so part of it's poking out the back, it gives me enough. So I think I'm going to make mine maybe 55 mil, 55 mil high. And Maybe 110 wide, I reckon. Just under four and a half inches, that is. And I can go along and just obviously draw my imperative. It's not all that imperative that these are exactly level and square and all that sort of stuff. It's just gonna look a bit more professional at the end. Okay, I'm gonna start with the front side. So we can give this a clean up, obviously, around the edges with a file or a flap wheel, whatever you want. I'm going to go and do the back one as well, and then we'll clean it all up at the same time. Cool. All right, change over to the flat wheel and give it all a clean up. So now I can go ahead and give the whole thing a clean up, get it all back to bare metal. Because obviously this isn't going to withstand any heat, so it's going to blister. So we've got to get it all off so we can paint it with heat proof paint. And I'm going to take it all off and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave this line. So I'm just going to leave a little gap here. So I'll be able to see where I'm going to cut. Um, and then I can cut it off and grind that little bit off afterwards. So this is the beauty of all being on the stand. It's solid, there's no holding it and rolling around and messing around with it. I'm just going back over my line before I cut, just so that it's easy to see, but 
before we chop it. And we go over any bits where you might have accidentally sort of nipped the line and take any, any back off of it. You want to just make sure that you know where it comes on and goes back off. So if you destroy yourself a couple of lines, and the reason we do lines is because, or with the rule is because if you just do that and they don't line up, you're stuck. So what my dad always used to say was do one straight and then one at an angle, and then you can do one around here that's straight, and then just in case anything gets knocked off with the grinder and you can't see it, you'll always know which one was which. So now to chop this, easy peasy. pretty much now I can go ahead and just put the flat wheel on and clean all this up clean these properly So the next thing we want to be doing is thinking about putting our burner in. Now, I got my burner and my refractory kit on my insulation from it. I don't think you'll find a better kit. Um, and it really sort of speeds up the process rather than trying to perfect the, the burner. Burners are pretty easy to make, but actually making one burn really well is a little bit more difficult. And if you want to just get that the insulation, the refractory, everything together makes a much better job. Now, this is how they do their system. They have quite a large um, sort of jet here which is all machined out really heavy duty like I say far better quality than just a bit of steel pipe um, now that actually obviously gets welded in now here is um, a debated issue see a lot of them they're straight in the top a lot of the square ones a lot of the rounded ones sort of come anywhere in the side people just sort of seem to willy nearly guess and I, there is probably a bit of an art to it so if, if you imagine this is a clock face 12 o'clock one o'clock, two o'clock, somewhere between the one and the two, so about there. And here's the other thing. If you're jetting straight down, you don't really want to be heating the actual piece of steel that you're working on directly because you'll just get a hot spot. You want to get actually the ambient temperature inside the whole chamber up to the same temperature, which gives you a really even temperature for forging. Sort of between one and two o'clock mark. Now, being a few degrees out isn't going to make a big difference. It's not the end of the world. You just really don't want to be pointing straight down at your piece of work or even like that straight at your piece of work. Put it a little tiny bit because you've got to remember that your circle of your inside of your liner is actually slightly smaller. So we're not trying to work to this surface to be square with this surface. We want to really be working to the inside surface. Right, so first stage is we want to mark it, but this is, our, this is a 67 mil uh, hole saw. It's a bi-metal hole saw, so it'll do the job. Um, we are going to mark it first. So you try to find one between sort of 64 and 67 mil because if it's too small, you can always just go around it with a file a little bit. I'm going to have to file this one anyway because we're not going straight in. We're going to go ever so slightly elongated. The hole will elongate a tiny bit. So we said we want to start. So if this is our center line around here somewhere, we want to go our sort of one, then two, maybe somewhere in between. So the seam down the middle of the tank once it's together is actually the middle and so we want to actually weld right in the middle of the middle if that makes sense so we're going to know we're on that that is our center line and then we want to look at it and go okay well there's our one there's our two we want to sort of be somewhere between them so that's about there so this is like i say it's a bit of a sort of guesstimate so we're going to put the line there the line there and then we know that's where we're going to put our burner so eventually it's going to look a bit like that although this will be partially sunken in and welded to it so let's drill that out okay so we're going to start by drilling this out stop it skating around we're going to do a little pilot drill it's in the middle 
You know how they do this, or put a hole punch in it. Actually, fine because this is a seam welded. We're actually, going through multiple layers of steel. So we're going through the weld, and then probably at least two layers of steel. They might have even folded it, so it could be three. But one will be stretched over top of the other, so at least two layers, and then weld all the way around. So then we can go up to the next size, and we should it should stop it skating around. Now we said that that's it, that's sort of perpendicular, so straight with the body of the forge. We want to ever go at a slight angle like that, like I said. So I'm going to start by drilling this in, get it to bite, and then I'll start tilting it out like this. So it's now already in there. So now I can. That. We've got this bit of steel 100 mil deep, so it's going to come out sort of here somewhere, which is perfect. We know our gap here is 140 mil, um, so the, we really want the shelf to be minimum of 140 mil. The thing I'm thinking about is having a fire brick that I don't have to take off, I can just maybe slide it to one side. See, it's pretty good. I can weld that on there. I'm going to also put a little flanges on here. All right, so ended up cutting corners off just to neaten it up a little bit, make it look a little bit more professional. Rather than a big chunk of steel. Apologies if, apologies if this bit's a bit uh, louder. We'll do this out at the front of the house. The reason for that is I'll be doing the installation, and it's not nice stuff. I don't really want it uh, in the house or around my kids. I'm doing it out the front where it's a bit windier, so you might hear some cars going past, um, and it will just sort of dissipate. It's not the world's worst stuff, but apparently you should wear a mask, so I will be, um, especially while I was cutting it, it will just disappear. So this is the kit that is from Artisan Products.
this and I'm gonna clean them up. Okay, we're gonna cut our insulation. Um, back on with the uh, protective gear again. Mask and some gloves so we can throw those away. Back outside again because we're cutting cutting this. Um, so thing to start with is something like this. This is actually just a hacksaw blade that's been cut down or sharpened it up nicely so it would pierce through. Uh, sort of been using one of these <coughs> for a long time. I used to build Rayburns and Argus. Uh, I don't know if you know what a Rayburn is, but I used to use this for doing Rayburns and Argus, so I used to cut this stuff quite a bit. And it actually makes a nice, easy job of it, so you just put it through. Using the blade bit on the back, you can actually sharpen that right up and just push that through. You get a good uh, hole. And then just essentially, we're following the line all the way around. Now, <coughs> the top line, I like the bottom line, sorry. I like to keep that nice and level, and I tend to cut on the way out so that it's not pushing it in, like so. Now the top one, I actually go in at a slight angle like that, so just a little bit, although I am going to build a shield on this one, which you probably don't need to, but if you're going to leave it like this, I tend to just thin it out a little bit, that front bit, just to give you a slightly wider opening. So I'm going to do that a little tiny bit. So just keep the same continuous angle and the same as before. Just cut as you're pulling out and you get a nice and neat straight finish. Now you can compress it a little bit with your fingers when you're doing the rigidizer. Like that's the same end and then basically the same on, on the edges. A little bit of an angle I like to use, like I said. Alright, so you get a lovely, neat, square finish. I don't know if you can see that. You don't have to mess around too much with the edges when you do it like that because you get a good square finish. A little bit of fluff there in the corners, but we'll just chop them out. Same with the back. Okay. So the last thing to do with this is to cut the hole out. Now I need to give credit to somebody for this one. Um, I would cut this out with a little saw like this. Um, or go all the way through. But this actually makes a lot of sense to me, which is why I'm now using it. And so we're going to start with a something that's got the same as the external diameter so the one we cut the hole out gives our external diameter and then we have a second one that's got the outside of this is the same as the internal diameter of this maybe ever so slightly larger so you can see why we're doing it in two seconds so we start put our protective gear back on that our burn is going to go at a slight angle so we're going to do that again on this one so just by hand we're gently going to go through now we don't want to go too far through because we don't want to punch it all the way out so what we can actually do is use something like this give us an idea on thickness and we go oh yeah maybe about halfway through so it's approximately halfway down those holes. Just pick a mark and be happy with it. You can draw on this if you want to. Okay, so just there is halfway down those holes. Now we're going to change our bits. 
through it, and then we're even not at that angle, we're at a slight angle, so we're going to mimic that again. So we get all the way through this time. So, as you can see in there, that hog goes right through it now. And then we've got to get this bit off because we want to get it out. So, with with one of these, you can you can just heat these up and bend them, but, but they tend to snap if you don't. So, if you heat that up and bend it, you can get a good sort of cutting angle on it, so you get a sideways cutter. But, we know we're going it's halfway down that hole, so about there somewhere, a little bit above my reach, so if you sort of work out where you are and kind of poke in all the way around about that same width, be careful not to disturb this too much, you should then to just pull this out. Now we can check that, so we're going to put this bit in. So, using that as a little bit of a seat, we can just get a flat finish on it. So you could put that in there and look in there and go, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. It's not, not protruding out too much. Just check that's going to go in and, and fit nice. And then really, all we're going to do is start welding this thing in. And we've got our burner positioned. It's easy as that. This is all going to go harder when we rigidise it, because before we put the burner in, we're going to spray our rigidizer, which makes all this go rock solid, because if you put this in, and then do it, you'll never get to this section and it will just keep falling apart on you. So what I like to do is just to sort of cover for myself, so I actually take a little bit of this again and I cut it or split it down lengthways. So it's actually grained that way. So you can actually lay couple of bits of that at the bottom and it works a bit like a spacer. So basically you're taking up some of that space that would be taken up by the cement with this just helps to uh, just it helps to make that cement go a little bit further, gives you a bit more play in there when you're, when you're sorting it out. So don't go mad because you want a good layer of cement there too. You're not trying to fill it up with this because you'll find that you actually end up with only that much cement and it, is, and it isn't enough. So a couple of little bits like that, maybe 10 mils thick. And you could spray the rigidizer at the same time. Now the bottom, again if you feel like you haven't got enough rigidizer, the bottom is less important because it's going to be covered in cement. Of course try to cover everything. And this entrance and all that, it, everything's very important, but this maybe not quite so much. But if you have got enough, then yeah of course put it on there. Okay, so this also comes in the gas kit from Artisan Products. This is the rigidizer, so this stuff, you just spray all over it, and it will make it go hard. So I'm going to put that on now, because I'm going to be calling it a day in a minute, because I've got to go out. Um, so I want this to go off, so before I put my cement in. So literally, you just turn your nozzle on, and just start spraying it, it'll come out. So it basically makes everything blue. Now start with this, because this is really quite important, this bit. Making sure you're happy with your opening, everything's in good shape, which it is. Nice flat surface in there. Just go a bit mad. It doesn't really, you can't put too much on. You want to soak it thoroughly. 
like that. So it's nice and blue inside. And then, because this is the biggest end, we're going to start in here. We'll just go mad soaking it up with blue everywhere. It's a blue colour all the way across. So, as you can see, I've got a really good sort of coating on the, all around these sort of entrance edges. Any place there isn't probably quite as much is so bloody blue, but black white doesn't is inside. I mean, actually, it's better like that actually without the light. But on the uh, base, because like I said, when I cover that in refractory cement anyway. But the reason I left this, I didn't weld this shelf on yet, is because. I wanted to be able to get the bottle sort of up and spray at every angle and I just felt like it would be in the way this time. Um, so I didn't put the shelf on. Next stage is we're going to put the shelves and the burner and everything in before we put the cement in. The reason for that is the cement is just essentially sitting there. It does bind to the inside of the refractory quite well, but you start rolling it over and turning it around and all that sort of stuff to paint it and all that afterwards, there's a good possibility it's going to come loose and actually move the insulation that around and it could even sort of fall out of its position so we'll put the steps the shelves and everything on wind the burner in um, cut the legs down where we want them get everything painted and get it pretty and then we'll put the uh, cement base in so what I'm going to do with this is we're going to put this shelf on as you can see I've marked the center of that now what I've done is I've put a level inside just to double check we're level. Now we're beautifully, perfect level from the front to the back. What I would like is to have, because this is quite a thin gauge of steel, and I'm going to let my cement float right up to this, even though it's thin, it may crack, but it will protect this for longer. Um, I'm going to put this on here. Now it sort of exposes this edge. So what I'm actually going to do is just use a little spacer. I'm just going to put that little spacer there, which brings that higher, which means when I put my level, when I put my steel plate on, it actually just brings it a little nat, like a couple of mils, same as that thickness above this piece. So we'll be able to get a good sort of finish to that. Now I'm going to keep this here so that I know this is level. because I want this shelf to be level with the inside of the cement. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a weight on the back of the level to stop it moving away and put this, see I've marked a center line, but you can't see the center line. So I also marked the center line, then marked either side, check they were right. So you can see, I can line them up now. And then I'll put a clamp on here just to hold it all where I want it. Now we can ensure because it's pressed up against the underside of this level, that this is level with the inside. Knowing that this little steel plate is creating a good space for us, keep us up high. Put a little weight on the back of the level to stop it trying to get away, or a clip or whatever you can use. Now the only one thing you want to double check is, because it's this isn't square, I mean we could put that central, that would probably help. Put our weight back on get these back where we want them put our spacer back underneath and what we want to just double check is you can actually feel it well, if, it's, if it's right or not because you'll feel that the discrepancy is the same from here to here that this isn't higher than this but we can just get a level let's put on the check now it's actually ever so slightly a level but well, I do know this bench is level so everything should go through as level so I can see that I need to lift that a tiny bit and that's still right in there. So I'm actually going to mark that so that when I'm welding I can just kind of hold that in place and check that that's right. The other thing I can do is probably put a mag magnetic um, clamp on there to try and get the magnetic clamp before I weld it. So when you're happy with that being level, I'm actually going to probably leave mine level on there because it's magnetic, I can do what I want with it. So we're, I'm happy that this is all 
solid now and it's hard up against here against the bottle I'm just going to put a couple of tacks underneath and then I'll put a seam across it when I'm happy with it all staying where it's supposed to be okay so I've decided to put some sides in the top on this same process as before to mark it to describe the shape so we've got two now now the only slight difference with this is because you're not going to it's not the underside you're going to see it you actually do it at a slight angle to mimic this so that when you put these pieces on they are straight like that you get a good flat weld against the side but also there's not an ugly sort of gap there you got to try to fill up with the welder um, especially if you only end up doing a couple of tacks because it's going to be welded to there welded to there probably a spot here and a bit in the top it doesn't need to be heaps and heaps of welding just a few spots will hold this all together really well okay starting like a forge now so just welded on this uh entrance point so give it a good sort of solid finish that's a serious bit of steel there so you can see that's basically a big rectangle give it something really hard to sit on something heavy and this is never going to go anywhere either now the next job is our burner now we talked about how the critical angle of the, of the burner so i cleaned up the jet just round so that i can get a good weld onto it so we remembered that going into the hole and then it's not quite straight so it's actually it should sit at a slight angle if we if we set our inside insulation right it actually is now tipping at that angle so if you look at it it's not going to be jetting right onto the floor and and sort of heating up anything that's there it's going to go off an angle like that which means it's going to start to create this vortex which is what we want so now we're just going to go ahead make sure it's straight this way and then just weld all the way around there. Okay, so fully welded on, ready to go. You can three thread it in. Now we're just gonna do a similar thing to we did before. Got another bit of plate here. Um, the hole isn't there for anything. It's just a piece of steel I had sitting here that was pretty much exactly the right size and it happened to have a hole in it. So I'm sure I'll work out some magical reason for the hole to be there. So same as before, scribe that in. Now I'll do the same as I did, run the level through it, clamp this up to the level, tack it on, then I can flip it over and weld it properly. All right, so it's got a back step, or shelf, it's got a front shelf, just gonna clean these little welds up a bit. And then go over and give the whole thing a sand. I'm gonna cut the legs shorter slightly, uh, so they fit on the stand that I built for it. Okay, so I've also knocked up this as a, as a forge base, like a trolley to put it on, so I'll be able to move it in and out as I want. It's made of just scrap from the scrapyard. It's literally all from the scrapyard, every bit of it. Um, I hadn't really done any welding before before I did this one, so this is kind of how I learned to weld on this thing. So I did this in a, probably a day, just messing around and just literally found all these bits that were scrappy. Um, so yeah, sort of taught myself the world on this so that I could do the next big project. Now that is 400 wide from there to there. So I'm going to sort of bring my, um, feet of my forge into maybe 320 so that it's sort of, it's not all the way to the edges. So there's no sort of sharp edges on it and then even put some slightly rubberized feet on it or screw up from underneath into it. Um, so if you want to see the video for how to make that, then look on my channel. So. Those wheels, by the way, are front wheels off a wheelchair, which was awesome. I was able to sort of grind the edges of the circuit a bit flat and just slide them straight up into the tim into the. So, we want our center line. We can actually estimate this. It's not all that crucial. That's how you ruin a level. Smack it against something steel or heavy. Okay. And then we're going to, I decided to go 330. So 165 from either side.
Now, just if you put go and do a line on the top as well, it means when you're cutting through, you'll be able to happy with the fact that your cut follows this line so it's a square cut as opposed to ending up going off on an angle point. It's sometimes hard to follow that. Pretty important to consider the uh, finish of it to make sure the paint adheres and it's really only for the paint to adhere and not really for looks for me I'm not actually that bothered I, I want it to look good but things like the weld here where I had trouble with it I, I'm not going to spend forever trying to file that down because I can't get the grinder in there it, it sort of shows the story of learning to weld and create these these things at the same time um, what you do want to do is make sure it's sort of roughed up all the way around there's no loose stuff on it you haven't got any of the sort of scorching from the uh for the welding from the welding because you see the paint's not going to stick to that very well so just get into that with a wire brush if you can we are um, ready for paint pretty much so what we do here uh, is this stuff is and grease remover it's pretty important if you spray paint onto something that's dusty and greasy it yeah, ain't gonna stick so it's quite imperative that it sticks um, it stops it rusting that sort of thing now this is something in a workshop does it really matter if it rusts over time probably not but why not start it out with a with a, a good finish on it at least so it's gonna last longer if possible so a couple of ways of going about this Start on the top, go to the bottom. I tend to think that you get the bottom done first, flip it over, it doesn't really matter if you kind of ruin the underside a little tiny bit. So things like this, I tend to uh, give these a clean up first. So there's not heaps of this in the can, but we're basically just spraying it on using a lint-free cloth. So a nice old pair of underpants or something that's generally been washed so many times, there's not a lot left in them. Give that a wipe over. See, there's a reasonable amount of dirt coming off, off that each time. You also want to make sure you get rid of <clears throat> all of this wax and grease remover first before you start painting. You're not going to be able to get in every little nook and cranny, but try your hardest and then give it a few minutes to dry, obviously, before you start, especially as it's in the sun, it will work alright for me. Before you start uh, painting spray paint, always wear a breathing mask because I'm outside, so it'll be windy. I have another big piece of plastic which I use as a guard, sort of helps stop the wind. You read your instructions on your can. This one's pretty good because you can recoat um, every 15 seconds or something. It's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so I'm going to start with the bottom because it's least important. So we can then let that dry a little bit and flip it over. So I went with a cast iron effect. Stuff about this. The thing about this stuff is, you can pretty much finish it all in one sitting. If you, leave, if you do get a bit you're not happy with, then and it goes off, then give it an hour, and then you can start another coat. And you can easily leave an hour in between, or get them on really fast. 
Don't be afraid to use too much either. Well, unless they get run. Here we are, next job is to fill up the inside. So you can see we have a perfect level finish between the front and back. We want to continue that level surface all the way through by filling up the inside of here with concrete. Now remembering we put two extra pieces in there just to fill it up a little bit. Hopefully we've got enough depth, enough there to fill it. Um, we got given a bag with the, the uh, cement concrete mix. Let's start mixing it up. You want this to be wet enough that you can get it in there, but not too wet that you've got water coming to the surface. Relatively dryish mix. Easiest way I think to do this is less of the messing around. You see people sort of jiggering it in, trying to get it in and out. To get something good size, see I've uh, I've wedged up the, the base of this so it's at a bit of an angle now. I'm going to go even further than that. I think now I've lifted it a bit more, raise it even higher because we're not going for a total liquid. It's not going to run out the back. So whilst we're putting it in there initially, I'll have it up sort of at a bit of an angle like this because we'll find it's far easier to get it in and out to get it in there. And then obviously once we're once we've got enough in, we can bring it back down to level and trowel it off. Okay, that's a perfect consistency there. A little bit of slump in it still, holds its shape mainly. Now I do this a lot, so I'm able to sort of estimate about the amount of water and about the amount of mix so that's pretty much exactly Pretty much proceed using whatever you can get in there. I can use this gauging trowel to get in there and just leveling it off. The most important bit really is to get level right through to front and back. Um, in theory, the sides aren't quite so important. It would be nice to sort of get it to go up at a slight angle either side, but it's less important because they're actually going to fill up with scale and jump from the from the uh, sort of leftover from metal anyway during the burning process. So, like I say, what's important is to get a nice shelf all the way through. So you I actually almost could have put more, more of that insulation in. We put two pieces of insulation in, maybe 10 mil thick. I would say we could have put significantly more than that in because that would be nice to be more full than that but what can you do eh okay and then just a bit more messing around in there get that nice and flat but you can see where we're going with it we'll see when it's done all right as you can see i i covered this up just pretty much to protect my um my paintwork a little bit like i said before it's probably not the end of the world if the paintwork isn't protected because it's going to get pretty scratched and damaged in no time at all it's going to get blacked up real fast but why not start off with a nice finish so i'm just going to take this off now the only really thing you're going to do after this is just pretty much leave it alone let let it go off you need to quite keep it straight and level Give it 36 to 48 hours and then I'll, I'll um, burn her up. Just drilling a couple of holes for some feet, which I had sitting around somewhere in a packet, from a job that never got used. I'll put them on next. So I've now mounted the forge to the uh, 
stand for the trolley that I made. As you can see, it's all gas bottles under there. It's almost ready to go. Put some put those feet on. I'm just about to start setting the burner up. Set it all out the packet. This, you could get some grips and really hang off of it, but right, this is where all the magic happens. This is where the fuel and air mixture is. Obviously, your gas is coming in here, your liquid, uh, your LPG, um, and then this essentially is what draws air in here through this venturi, um, and you're shutting or opening it with this in train air into it. Now these look like they're all done already. All these are done, ready to go. In fact, you can see a joint paste in there, so same thing as before. So this is a 15mm nut, I'm just going to tighten that up until it's locked in place. This is my darling wife. <laughs> Not too tight for the brass. Final thing is gas regulator. That doesn't need any sort of joining compound on it, just does up tight, not crazy tight because you'll damage the thread, but that's about it. Okay, with a little bit of a uh, bit more thought into this, I've decided I'm probably going to um, have my burner this way. It kind of gets it out of the way. Hopefully, any heat, obviously, most heat's going to go pretty much straight up, so we're not going to have any issue with the line melting or getting it too hot. And of course, obviously, once I've started messing around with it, I might need to adjust it for that reason. But um, I'd like to have it sort of taking up as little real estate in the workshop as possible. Things sort of out of the way, heat should come up and sort of disappear without too much issue. Now I can bring it around further if I need to. Now it runs down through the hole in the back, down to the gas bottle, through the regulator. And you know what? We're pretty much ready to stick some fire in this thing. I think we're almost ready for initial burn. Okay, so pretty much ready for initial burn. First thing to do is we haven't tested any of these gas lines, is to check all these nuts. Now the best way to check it is smelling is one thing, but it could take time. You don't know about very small leaks. Start by turning it on. Get yourself, if you haven't got it in a spray bottle, you get special stuff called LDF, which is leak detection fluid. You can make it yourself. A little bit of water, reasonable amount of washing up liquid. Um, so it's a soapy sort of liquid. You can feel the soapiness in it, so it should be quite soapy. And all you're going to do is soak those joints. Now, the ones that are designed for it, like the ones that go into the from the regulator to the gas bottle, should be fine because they've got a rubber seal in it. All the rest of these, we don't know anything about this regulator. We just know we just bought it. We don't know if it's been tested in the factory, anything like that, because we've got no paperwork for it. So we just put this on, and if there is a leak, you will see a huge bubbles immediately bubbles will just pop for it a tiniest leak will create a lot of bubbles so same thing with all of this you will see lots of bubbles coming out of, the, out of where the gas is so today is the day we're going to put uh fire the forge up for the very first time this is our first test fire as you can see been building this for a couple of days it's a family occasion everyone's coming to look we're going to see if we uh blow anything up so we know our gas is on there, gas is off at this point. So we'll turn this on, we'll be able to hear the gas come through and then we'll light it up. It's gonna take a bit of fettling to get the, uh, get the burner right, I would think. We can hear the gas, turn it down low so it happens. Hey, you made me jump. You made you jump, darling? Yeah. All right. That gas is hardly even on. 
probably turn our pressure down. This is obviously daytime, so it's a little bit hard to see what's going on, but you can see it's warming up beautifully in there. We should get a really good temperature up really quickly. The board has been up and running for maybe two and a half, three minutes, so it's never been burned before. I haven't let it actually warm up, I just threw this piece of steel in immediately. It's actually running really well, you can tell by the sound of it. Now it's daytime, so it's hard to tell, but you can see that that's you can see that that's pretty red and it's gonna obviously get hotter really quickly. So we're not we're not far off being able to forge it. So if you like the table, watch my other videos. Alright, I feel that was totally successful. I can't really think of a great deal I'd change um, about this forge. There's a possibility I would make these sections here a little shallower so they go in further. And the reason for that is because they supply a heat brick um, and it I wanted it to sit on there as you can tell it clearly doesn't fit because the brick is wider than than that which is a bit of a pain in the butt so I'll probably get smaller bricks for it this one can be used successfully on the back because obviously we put a shelf on for this specific reason Awesome. Need a bucket of water to put this in. <laughs>